Our next presenter here at Save Lives U is a seasoned and international speaker who began presenting at the age of 18. I was a lot older than that when I gave my first public presentation. She has since then given over 800 pro-life presentations all across North America and around the globe. She has a real specialty for speaking and inspiring people at post-secondary institutions, and she has spoken at places such as Yale University, George Washington University, and UC Berkeley. Yes, that University of California, Berkeley. She also made international waves when she was a presenter for the series Talks at Google when she spoke about abortion, believe it or not, at Google headquarters in Mountain View, California. If you've not seen that video, uh, you're probably one of the few people on the planet that has not seen that yet. Make sure to Google it when we're done. Google, talks at Google, Stephanie Gray, and you will be uh, inspired by her presentation. She has debated abortion advocates and physicians who do abortions. And as she's traveled around the world, her audiences are vast, including medical students, law students, churches of all kinds of different denominational backgrounds, seminaries, high schools, schools, pro-life organizations, the list goes on and on. In addition to speaking about abortion, she also presents talks on assisted suicide and is very gifted at talking about end of life issues as well. And particularly relevant for those of us here, uh, she is going to be one of the featured speakers at Focus's SEEK conference with uh, 10, 15, 17,000 students in Indianapolis, Indiana this coming January. And she'll share a little bit more about that. She's the author of the book, Love Unleashes Life, Abortion and the Art of Communicating Truth, which is the topic we'll be tackling today. She's also written a physician's guide to discussing abortion. I would like you to join me in welcoming our presenter for this topic, Love Unleashes Life, Abortion and the Art of Communicating Truth, the president of Love Unleashes Life. Please welcome my dear friend and colleague, Stephanie Gray. Stephanie, how are you today? I am well. And hello to everyone, and thanks for having me as part of your program. Oh, well, first off, let's just have a little bit of fun. What are you most excited about while speaking to all of those assembled that Save Lives You? What excites you about this gathering? I think that people here are people of influence, that each one of us are connected to individuals that other people aren't connected to. And so it's exciting to be able to share what I've learned with someone who will be connected to people I will never meet, but by <laughs> me sharing something I know that that can change indirectly in another person's life. So I'm just so excited to be with people who not only realize their power and their influence, but want to actually use it and make mm -hmm. a positive difference. Mm -hmm. And for those who have not yet been blessed to experience your amazing work, I've been so excited about having you as one of the presenters here, and I'm excited to hear you speak in person at SEEK. I've heard you speak numerous times personally Personally, we've shared the platform together. But Stephanie, for those who may not know your background and how at age 18, you got drawn into this work of speaking out and advocating the truth, give us a little bit of background. Tell us how you got to where you are today. Sure. Well, it began even earlier than when I was 18. I often describe myself as a child activist. I grew up in a devoutly pro-life, devoutly Catholic home, and uh, both my parents were involved in the pro-life movement. Uh, both of them would go to conferences and rallies and protests, uh, and my mom in particular volunteered at a pregnancy care center. And so often as a child, I would go with her when she was counseling pregnant girls, and I would play with fetal models, and I would doodle on letterhead, and <laughs> then when her clients gave birth, I'd go to the hospital with her and see the babies. So from a very young age, I knew about the topic of abortion. I knew my parents were doing something about it. And I loved babies. And I wanted to do something about it, too. So when I went to a Catholic high school, I got involved in the campus or the, the high school pro-life club. And I remember in 12th grade, someone came to my school who was with the, basically, you could say the Canadian equivalent of Students for Life of America. Of course, I'm, I'm a Canadian. I live in Vancouver. And so uh, this, this woman who was with the group called National Campus Life Network basically presented to us high school students that when we go to college, we need to be salt and light wherever we go. And if we want to be salt and light, particularly on the life issue, to contact her and she'll plug us into a pro-life group on our campus. So I did exactly that. And so I graduated the next year and I went off to the University of British Columbia, got involved in the pro-life club. And it was through that that I attended a conference for college students where I heard a speaker who changed my life. Mm. His name is Scott Klusendorf. And at that conference, he said, there are more people working full time 
to kill babies than there are working full time to save them. Mm. And I and my friend who'd attended with me both felt the Holy Spirit convict our hearts to work full time saving babies. And we left that conference convicted that we were going to finish our degree and we were going to do just that. And that was 20 years ago. And my friend Athena is now Sister Antoniana with the Sisters of Life. So she is true to her commitment and is doing full time pro life work. And uh, I also, 20 years later, am still doing the full time pro life work through doing public speaking that Scott mentored me in. Mm. So your topic today, the abortion, the art of communicating truth. Stephanie, you've had lots of years of experiencing it. And I don't know about you, but I did it all wrong at the beginning before I learned, oh, a lot of what I'm trying to do in communication is is not successful and is actually pushing people away rather than drawing them in. One of the words I hear you use a lot is winsome. Why is it important when communicating with somebody about abortion, be it somebody in an unexpected pregnancy or just somebody on the other side of an ideological divide, why is being winsome such an important first step? Great question, because all Ultimately, our goal is not merely to win an argument, it's to win the person. You know, if we communicate the facts in a really forceful, upfront way, but we don't actually win the person, then has our cause advanced any further? And then oftentimes that's that's not the case. But if we're winsome, if we can communicate truth, even hard truths, but in a compassionate and thoughtful way, in a way that draws the person in rather than pushes them away, then I think we're going to be more successful and and our work will will bear much fruit. Mm -hmm. So give us a... a, go, Go ahead, please. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so then so then, what comes to mind, even if I think of my own um, transition over time, you know, from the very beginning when I when I heard Scott Klusendorf and he was really communicating a lot of the logic, how do you use science and philosophy to defend the pro-life perspective, to respond mm-hmm. to the most common objections you hear from abortion supporters? And how do you do it in a kind way? Scott very much emphasized that. But I would often say that I'm wired to just be super logical. And so all the arguments I was hearing made so much sense to me okay. that I thought, well, if I just tell everyone what makes sense to me, it will make sense to them. And as the years went on, and as they continue to go on, I very much started to see that as logical as the pro-life perspective was, that we can't just have an approach that targets our messaging towards the head on a very intellectual level. We also need to know how to reach the heart of the Mm -hmm. person to kind of pause and ask ourselves, where are they coming from? Could there be a place of woundedness? Could they have had a negative experience themselves? Could they have had an abortion or someone they care about has had an abortion? And could that be influencing their ability to receive my message? And if I don't pause, slow down, and ask where they're coming from, seek to understand them, then I might have a difficult time getting my logic through. So what I've, I've done over the years is I've not abandoned any of the logic, but I have added to it a lot more messaging that involves hearing people's stories and reaching the heart and not just the head. So give us a couple examples of this when you're thinking about communicating with somebody about this most contentious topic of abortion. Again, whether it's a student in a crisis pregnancy, whether it's somebody who is just uh, you know, wanting to argue about this, how do you balance the head and the heart and make sure you're communicating to both for those who are like you, very logical, but also those who maybe the emotional heart issues are going to be the ones that will be more convicting? Mm. Mm. Well, what kind of- comes to mind is actually an experience I had on a college campus during Q&A after one of my talks. And there was a long lineup of students at the microphone and this one girl gets up and she says, what about rape? I mean, what if someone hasn't consented to the sex? Now they're pregnant, they should be allowed to have an abortion. Now that's a question that you can have a very logical answer for, but it often is asked from a place of the heart, from a place of pain. But the reality is I find that usually when asked tough questions, it's helpful to start from an intellectual perspective, but be prepared to bridge. So my initial response to her is what I typically say to people, which is to start with sympathy and end with a question. So I said, I agree with you. Rape is a horrible evil. It's it's totally unjust. There aren't words to describe how vile it is. And, and I agree with you that we need to provide special care and support for victims of sexual assault. I also think I said that we need more serious consequences for the aggressors, for the victimizers in this situation. And then I said to her, a question I have to ask myself is this. Is it fair to give the death penalty to the innocent child? Mm. And when I've asked people that question, a lot of them have paused and said, oh, I never thought of it that way. 
But this girl wasn't like that. She immediately reacted with, yeah, but. So then I thought, okay, I often teach people, if you want to know how to interact well with others, model Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, throughout the scriptures, we see him interacting with people time and again. And Jesus asked good questions like I had done, but Jesus also told parables. He told good stories. So I thought, okay, maybe my question didn't resonate with her because she needs more than a question. Maybe she needs a story. So I said, okay, well, you know what? I want you to imagine this. I said, imagine you have a woman who has consensual sex with her husband on, let's say, a Monday. And the following day, when she's coming home from work late at night, she's raped by a stranger. So that in a month's time, when she finds out she's pregnant, she doesn't know, looking at that positive pregnancy test, whether the child's father is her husband or the rapist. Mm -hmm. So I said, let's imagine she carries on with the pregnancy, hopes it's her husband's child. And after birth, they run a paternity test. And those results come back and say, child's father is actually the rapist. I then asked her a question after that little parable. Would we allow that woman or anyone to kill the newborn child because of the father's crime? She said, well, no, of course not. So then I said, okay, then why would we allow a woman or anyone to kill a preborn child because of the father's crime? And she said, Mm. yeah, but, you know, we went back and forth a couple more times on an intellectual level. Nothing was getting through to her. And I thought, there are lots of other students with questions. I need to respect their right to ask. So I asked her to speak to me one-on-one at the end. And sure enough, at the end, she came up to talk with me. And I began to wonder, is my logic not getting through? Because I could be speaking to a hurting soul. And so at that point in our encounter, I, I just shared with her that, that I have a friend who was molested as a child. I'm one of a small group of people who she disclosed this to. Mm. And I said, I was one of the people to help journey with my friend to get healing. And one of the things that became clear to me is that when someone's been sexually assaulted, that whether they get pregnant or not, they've been victimized. And an abortion won't take that original trauma away. And at that moment, the moment I shared that story about my friend, this girl looked at me with profound sadness and said, yeah, 10 years and counting. Mm. And that was her moment of reveal. And I just said, I am so sorry for your suffering. And our whole conversation changed direction. It went from the head to the heart. I, I set aside my arguments and I asked questions like, how are you doing? You know, do you feel you've had adequate counseling? Can I help connect you to more support or help? And, and I really saw her soften and change when she saw I could meet her in her pain and her story. Right. Well, you have really uh, given a beautiful example of connecting the head and the heart. And I have heard you give many more of them, as I'm sure you will do when you speak at Focus's SEEK conference in Indianapolis. Um, One thing that, Stephanie, you have a beautiful way of doing is articulating life issues, not only at the beginning of life, as relates certainly here to the topic of abortion and those who are in an unexpected pregnancy, uh, but I also have heard you speak on issues related to the end of life and realizing that they're also in the midst of all of this myriad of of issues that affect the the dignity of human life that we understand given to us by God, um, that there's there's pain and that there's suffering in the midst of this. And I was wondering if you could just maybe share a little bit, you know, you've, you've kind of evolved and matured in your understanding of these issues. How has pain and suffering and and how we respond to Mm -hmm. that kind of come to the forefront in your speaking and in your ministry work? Yes. Yeah. Great question. Something I'm super passionate about. Um, as as uh, you mentioned, in, in me being at, speak, at SEEK, I will be not only speaking on abortion, but also on assisted suicide. And it's in that second topic that I'll really be addressing the question of how do we deal with suffering and challenges and difficulty and pain? Because when it comes to presenting the pro-life message to the culture, we can't take suffering away necessarily. We can't take the pain and challenging dilemma someone is in entirely away, Mm -hmm. but we can alleviate it with a new perspective. And so what I often draw on when I teach people is the writings and the philosophy of Dr. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, survivor and a psychiatrist. And he wrote an incredible book, one of my favorites called Man's Search for Meaning. And in this book, he talks about the last of the human freedoms that can't be taken from us is the freedom to choose how to respond to the situation that we're in. Mm. And our culture kind of gets it wrong. It stops his insight halfway through, thinking, well, the last of the freedoms that can't be taken from us is the freedom to choose, you know, period, end of sentence. But Frankel's um, whole philosophy is really about how we choose. And that connector word, it's how we choose to respond to the situation that we're in. And so one of the things he talks about is that when we experience suffering, as humans inevitably will, as he did in the concentration camps, as his clients have, and and did 
Uh, when we face suffering, the determining factor about whether we despair or not in light of suffering is whether we find meaning. And so Dr. Frankel presents presents this as a mathematical equation. He writes as D equals S minus M. So despair is suffering without meaning. So since we can't eliminate suffering, we will increase or decrease despair in light of suffering to the extent that we increase or decrease our meaning. And so Dr. Frankel gives an example of a young woman, a teenager from Texas who got in a car accident, became a quadriplegic, profound suffering. Did she despair? She didn't. Why didn't she despair? He said, let me tell you how she spends her days. He said she spends her days watching the news, reading the news. And whenever she comes across a story of someone who's suffering, someone who's going through a difficult time, she will call her assistant to bring her a little stick and, and, and place that little stick in her mouth. And because, again, she's paralyzed uh, as a quadriplegic, she then uses the stick in with her mouth to pound out letters on a keyboard in order to write notes of encouragement to people that she read about in the news. And Franco said, let me tell you, this young woman lives a life of profound meaning, of profound joy and profound purpose, yeah. even in the presence of her suffering, because it's through her experience of suffering that she has gained a profound empathy for others who are suffering, and that gives her purpose to try to alleviate their suffering, mm -hmm. and so she has no reason to despair. Mm -hmm. And so I, I often talk about that at SEEK, I'll be elaborating on this point, about how we want to help people find meaning in whatever situation that, that they're in, mm -hmm. so that they don't despair. So Stephanie, can I just dig into that for one second? Um, and, and I know we don't have a tremendous amount more time here, but when you think about a student who encounters another student who is in an unexpected pregnancy, frequently that person is in a moment of despair or, or panic or, or just feeling overwhelmed. And can you connect the dots? How would that, what Dr. Frankel taught, D equals S minus M, how could you help to connect meaning in that moment to help that student be able to work through that despair in a way that doesn't cause the loss of life, life of the child? Mm-hmm. Great question. So a couple thoughts come to mind. One question I think that's really good to ask someone is who inspires them mm. and ask them why that person inspires them. And when that woman in crisis starts to say, you know, well, my mom inspires me or my friend inspires me or my cousin inspires me or this person in history inspires me. And they start to describe why inevitably what I have found is I've asked that people that question. They will start to say, well, because this person went through a really hard time, but they didn't give up. Mm. Or um, this really horrible thing happened to them, but they brought good out of it. Or they faced this challenging situation and it was super hard to do the right thing, but they did it anyways. And once they start to come alive talking about that person and why they're so inspiring, I will then apply that to their situation and say, okay, well, isn't the best way to honor your mom, your friend, this person of history is to model their example in your own life. And you're undoubtedly also in a difficult situation in a moment of crisis like they were. Mm -hmm. And just as they didn't give up, just as they put others ahead of themselves, just as they did the right thing, even when it's hard, how can you do that here? And, and what can that look like? You know, and one other quick example that comes to mind is a friend of mine, um, Liana, was uh, raped at the age of 12 and became pregnant. And she was offered an abortion and she declined the abortion because she had asked the doctors if um, having an abortion would take away all the memories and the horrible feelings she had about the rape. And they had to acknowledge that technically it wouldn't do that. So she said, I, I carried to term. She goes, I, I, all I knew, she said, was that there was a life inside of me and that life needed me. But as Leanna progressed through the pregnancy, she obviously couldn't shake the memories of the trauma. She felt so dirty. She felt so awful. Mm. And so she was so overwhelmed by the trauma of the rape that she was tempted to kill herself. Mm. She was tempted to commit suicide. And Leanna said the reason she didn't kill herself was because she was pregnant. And she knew that if she killed herself, that it would kill her child. Mm. And so that's an example where I think of she was able in the profound suffering she went through, she was able to find meaning by being other oriented that ended up benefiting herself. Because in thinking about the child and not wanting to kill the child, it resulted in the preservation of her own life. And Leanna said to me, yes, I saved my daughter's life, but she saved mine. Her daughter became her will to live, her motivation to get through the difficult time and, and became, became her best friend. So if we can help people find meaning and overcome um,
Stephanie, we're having a little bit of a technical challenge. There you go, you're back now. Sorry, if you can, we can help people finish the thought there. Is, sorry, and the last thing you heard was if we can help people. Yes, and then just that finish the that thought. Yes, that was the okay. last you heard, sorry. So if we can help people um, in their suffering, in their difficulty, find meaning, find yes. some way to live for the other, um, to follow the examples of others that have been inspiring and, and something worthy of emulating, then that can give people the drive they need to overcome the obstacle and not despair. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, Stephanie, I, I know our time is up here, but I'm super excited for those who are going to get the opportunity to hear you at SEEK. For those who are saying SEEK and focus and coming to hear Stephanie Gray, what's that all about? If you had just you know, a quick fleeting moment to tell somebody why should they come to Indianapolis to be a part of SEEK and particularly what will they experience when they attend either of your two talks there? What would you say to that person? Sure. Well, because we humans are made for relationship. We are made for connection. As the Trinity is a communion of persons, we are to be a communion of persons. And SEEK is an incredible opportunity to bring thousands and tens of thousands of people together in community to know they are not alone and that they are in this journey to our heavenly home. And in particular, I'm excited to be able to equip people on this journey to better talk in a winsome and compelling and kind way on these really touchy, sensitive subjects like abortion and assistance suicide. And both of those presentations really reinforce this message that we're not alone. That woman in crisis who's pregnant, she's not alone. Her child is with her and a community of people can be with her. Right. The person at the end of their life suffering, going through hardship, they're not alone. And so there will be practical um, ways to speak to others to reinforce this message and have that message reinforced with the community around you at this amazing event. So I'm excited to go. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much. And I know that everybody's been blessed by what you've shared today. And, and I particularly think the point that really stirred me is taking from the title, Man's Search for Meaning, Dr. Victor Frankel. And as you described that uh, despair is uh, suffering without meaning. And for, I hope everybody participating in Save Lives You understands that they have the opportunity to help somebody who may be in a time of suffering, who may be feeling sense of despair, to understand that there's profound meaning in the midst of that. And thank you for being such a beautiful messenger of that in such a winsome way. Stephanie Gray, thank you so very much. And I'm excited to see you in person at SEEK as I'm sure everybody else is. Thank you so much for being a part of Save Lives You today. Appreciate you, God bless you. Thank you, God bless you all too.